Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Ohio Energy Project's Careers in Energy Virtual Field Trip. I am your moderator today, Monique Heath, and today you will learn about electricity generation, transmission, and distribution, as well as some electrical safety and career opportunities. I want to say welcome to all of our participating schools from OEP. We have careers in energy schools watching us today. We have students studying electricity and electrical safety. We are so happy to have you join us and all of our guests this afternoon. We're in for a, a great treat today. Just some housekeeping items to, re, to be remindful of. We do have two platforms of watchers today. We have people that are watching us in classrooms around the state on Zoom. So if you are watching from Zoom, please post any of your questions via the Q&A box and not the chat box. We also have viewers on YouTube watching us, so please ask questions in the live chat and comment box. Please limit comments in the chat to questions for your site host. I wanna say a huge thank you to AEP Foundation for hosting the Careers in Energy program. Thank you for all of your support and allowing this event to go on today. And a huge thanks to our host today, Westerville Electric Division. I, you're in for a treat, like I said at the beginning, but before we get started, I wanna give you some background information about Westerville Electric Division. Um, Westerville Electric Division serves the city of Westerville with a population of about 40,000. Westerville is a suburb on the Northeast side of Columbus. Westerville is a public power community and a member of the American Municipal Power. We're now going to start with a video introduction to electricity distribution. One of the things I think we often take for granted when you go home and flip the light switch on and the power is always on is all of the work that goes behind that. That power as a human context, it, it really involves people behind it. Westerville is a public power system. That includes about 17,000 customers, about 12.6 square miles. We're not for profit. All of the revenues we collect go back into the system, which allows us to be a lot more responsive than a larger investor-owned utility. The electric division handles its own electricity. Many place else I've ever been, it's always been a private company that manages the electric. So just being a part of that is humbling. We bring a lot of our guys right out of high school and then we put them through a five-year apprenticeship. They've grown up on this system. They know all the streets in town. If you can keep those guys with good wages and good benefits, they're gonna be better for your system. That's how we achieve a 99.998% reliability rating. Everybody at the shop, all the guys, they're like a really close community. Really good to work with, honest, hardworking. Definitely have a very big, hardworking bunch. It's like having a bunch of brothers here. They're not as rough and mean as brothers were. We may get called in at two o'clock in the morning, but we know every inch of this system. We have very good communication. We don't have to worry about somebody heating something up on you. We could be across town working on something and get a call from the other side of town and we can be there in 20 minutes. You put your strobes on, people move out of the way, and you're there, nothing flat. A typical day depends on what crew you're on. We have an underground crew, two overhead crews, and a trouble truck. From our line group that does the construction, to our tree trimmers, to our meter technicians. Hop in the trucks, go out to the job site. At that point they do it, it's called a job site analysis, where they get together as a group to identify all the hazards. We're not in a rush, even though it's a trouble call. Know where you're walking and what you're doing. And then they start their work. Electric utility industry is one of the most dangerous industries in the world. People don't want their power off anymore, so we have to work everything hot. When electricity gets out of the wire, it usually creates a great big blue ball. It's hotter than the sun. The aluminum, the copper, is all turning into projectiles. Yeah, it can be really intense. We call it the blue monster. It's something you don't ever want to see, but when you do see it, you have to be prepared for it. You have to respect it because if you don't, it will disrespect you in a heartbeat. <laughs> it's the way I can say it. We try and stay ahead of everything all the time. How long is it going to take somebody to stop? They're probably going to hit the brakes and they're going to start thinking, where are they going to end up? Fall protection, arc flash, FR clothing, all these things are pretty recent to the industry. And we've been ahead of the curve on all of them. You know, everyone always asks about Westerville. I know you're a good group of guys. Keep staying after it and just be safe. 
We're gonna de-energize that transformer and pretty much what we're gonna do is move wire from the old pole to the new pole. It's not phase coded at all, so when you go to cut, before you cut, mark, mark, mark everything. So this week we are pulling a new cable. Usually most of our overhead wire is bare. This actually has an insulator on it where trees can lay against it and it won't burn. The Circuit 41 rebuild project kind of exemplifies public power. It was late 2017. We recognized that we were having a number of outages on that circuit. It ranked to be the worst performing circuit on our distribution system to heavily treated corridor to tight build. We were just getting crushed any time there would be a windstorm coming through or just branches falling down. If we see the results that we expect, we start implementing this type of aerial spacer cable through other wooded corridors as we continually push for higher reliability and reduce our outage time as much as we can. Everything is so technology based anymore. The need for electricity is just gets greater and greater all the time. Reliability on our electric system, that's huge for us and we take a lot of pride in it. It's not always the most glamorous thing. Our cable replacement project we did at the end of this year, we put over five miles of new underground cable in. So you can't really see the improvements, but you know we won't have to go back to that circuit for 35 or 40 years. It's definitely a very rewarding feeling keeping the lights on for City of Westerville. We recognize that we're part of the community and that means more than just serving you electricity and making sure that the power's up. Being a public power community is, is pretty special. There are people out there every single day making sure our system is designed, built safely, so that way when you do go home, you flip the light switch on, you've got power, and that's really important to us. It's not simply, this comes down, we just put it back up. We put a lot of thought and a lot of time into how we do our loops, how we make things as reliable as possible, improvements in safety for linemen. That's important to us, because we're part of this community too. The personal touch that we offer when we're doing the work in your backyard, end of the day, that's really what it's about for us. What a cool video. It is now my pleasure to introduce Chris Monticelli, who is the utility manager at Westerville Electric and a member of OEP's board of directors. Chris, you can take it away. Thanks, Monique, I really appreciate it. I just wanna take a minute to welcome you all to the Westerville Electric Division. I look forward to a day when we can do this in person and we don't necessarily have to do it virtually, but this is where we're at right now and, and I'm glad to ha have a moment to, to spend some time with you all. So, a uh, little bit of background about Westerville. So we are a public power community that was uh, talked about a little bit about in that video. But really what we do is we are a distribution electric system for the city of Westerville. We serve our residents and businesses here across our footprint. What has always fascinated me about the electric grid is at this very moment in time, every one of the buildings that you all are in and the building that I am in right here is physically connected to a power plant someplace that's generating electricity in real time. So that means that if that physical connection is broken at any moment in time, anywhere along this distribution or, or transmission grid, you all lose power. It's, it's quite an impressive uh, demonstration of, of how this all works. So uh, these power plants up there in the far top corner there, um, they generate electricity. They could be hundreds of miles away. And so that physical connection, that wire that connects all the way back to your building right now or your house, wherever you're at, uh, is connected into one of those power plants. That could be coal, that could be natural gas, that could be wind, that could be solar. I'm not sure about solar today here uh, in Columbus, Ohio, where it's cloudy, but uh, solar is becoming a lot more popular. Um, so that, that electricity is generated at this moment in real time. Every time you flip that light switch on, every time you turn on your Xbox or whatever that may be, uh, electricity somewhere is being generated to, to provide that service to you. And it's our responsibility as an electric distribution system to make sure that those connections remain in place all the time so that way you have power all the time. Um, and so just to talk a little bit about the whole entire thing, like I said before, the power plant is what's generating the electricity. Like that comes in many forms and those forms are changing pretty dramatically in the last couple of years. The electric industry as a whole is changing more in the last two or three years, four or five years than it has in the 50 before that. That's because people are, are expecting more from their um, electric providers. They're expecting generating sources from uh, more sustainable sources. So that's solar and wind and other things and hopefully some new innovations that are even yet to come. Um, 
So if you look at this, this chart and this graphic we've got up on the screen here, that's just a kind of a depiction of how the whole grid works in, in a simple, simple fashion. The power is generated. It's uh, sent out over what we call transmission lines. So these are really long, long hundreds of miles worth of lines. And that is, is transmitted all the way back to, to you. And, and so if you look toward the bottom of the screen, um, this is where we come into play. This is our role in this as Western Electric. And we, we are what's called a distribution electric provider. So that transmission um, system brings that electricity into the city at a substation. At the substation, the voltage of the electricity stepped down and then we distribute it to all of our businesses and residents in the city. What's really neat about that is even just our small electric system here in Westerville, uh, we have 40,000 people here that live in, in the city of Westerville, right about 40,000 people. It's about 17,000 homes. Um, we employ 44 people here at, just at our little department. Uh, we have lots of different employment opportunities, anywhere from line workers, which you'll hear a lot more about here coming up in our, in our video that follows my presentation. Uh, we have arborists who are, uh, who help keep the lines safe and protected. Um, so they do all the tree trimming and the, and the tree maintenance that we need to make sure that our uh, electric system is up and running as much as possible. Uh, we have electrical engineers that design this system. So they're responsible to make sure that all electric flows appropriately and, and it works the way it should work. We've got an operations manager who's responsible to um, make sure the system's running all the time. And if it does, uh, if we do have an outage, he's responsible to make sure that we get that fixed as quickly as possible. Uh, we have accountants like myself. My background is actually in accounting, so I have a business degree. We have others in our administration uh, roles that, that help support that whole entire um, operation. We even have a traffic signal technician here. So um, just here at our little small electric system, we have just a wide range of, of employees and that come from different backgrounds that help us make sure that we're running the, uh, the most efficient an effective electric system as we can. Chris, uh, what's, I don't mean to interrupt you, but we do have a couple of questions that have came, kind of came through. Um, we have a great question from Mark Staffen, who says, how does solar panels produce electrical power? Solar panels are, are really exciting. And they are, uh, what's most exciting about them is, is you're able to produce electricity more closely to where it's used than ever before. So uh, a lot of people are actually, you're seeing them put solar panels on their house. And they are designed and built to absorb energy from the sun and transfer that into electricity. And so that can be connected on a small scale straight into your house or on even a larger scale in one of those big fields out in the middle of nowhere that can connect into the larger electric system and, and into the distribution and transmission system, depending on the size. That's what really makes a solar is such an exciting source of electricity. Awesome. We also have another great question from Molly Hinkle, who's, who's want, wanting to ask, how many power plants are there in Ohio and what kind of power plants are they? That's a great question. I actually don't have the, the number, the exact number of power plants that are here in the, in the state of Ohio. I do know we have a wide range of types, though. So we have, I know we have coal plants. Uh, we have natural gas power plants. Uh, there are wind turbines in Ohio. Um, there's biomass where they, they capture gas being uh, emitted from uh, landfills and, and turn that into electricity. And obviously there's lots of solar, which is becoming the most popular uh, uh, and easy to develop um, type of generation. Uh, we have a great question, a student question. Is it possible to overproduce electricity? It, it is. And that's part of the responsibility of the utility. So it's, it's our job to make sure that we buy and produce the right amount of electricity that can serve our businesses and residents the right way at the right time. So that's a, that's a critical role in the planning for the electric utility to do, to do that. Awesome. I'll take another question. Another question from Molly Hinkle. Um, if the power goes out, how do you know which line is out so you can fix it? That's a really good question. Uh, there's a, in, the, in the old days, what we would do is we'd actually walk the line and actually still do that yet today. So uh, if it, what we know here back in the system, we've got a, what's called a SCADA system. So that, that tells us what's happening on our electric system all the way out throughout. If there's, a, if there's an interruption in power, we kind of have an idea where that interruption occurred, which circuit that's on. So what we do is and when that happens immediately, we send line workers out to that circuit and they try to walk the line to identify what has happened that caused the electricity. And I'll tell you, the number one cause of those outages is squirrels. 
squirrels and small animals. They love the heat that's generated. They like to chew on the lines. And that is a, a recipe for disaster for the squirrel. Uh, the other the big cause is, is trees. So we look for tree limbs that may have touched lines and things like that that may cause that outage. Newer technologies are, allow, are allowing us to, to shorten that length and to understand exactly where the outage occurred to hopefully reduce the time that power is out. Uh, we have a great YouTube question uh, from Tessa. How long does it take to build a power line? really depends. And so even, even types of power lines are, are, are different. So here in the city of Westerville, we have overhead and underground power lines. Uh, and, and sometimes the overhead tends to be a little bit easier to construct because it requires us just putting a pole on the ground and then building all the, the lines above the ground. And then the underground ones, actually, we have to bore in conduit or bore the cable under the ground. There's lots of other utilities and other things underground that make that a little bit more challenging. The underground lines, however, they tend to hold up a little bit better over time and are less less exposed to the elements and squirrels that might chew on them. So um, it's a give and a take. And in our system, we have about half of our lines above ground and half of, a li of our lines um, overhead. And uh, our crews here that we employ at the city do both. So they can both fix overhead and underground and construct both of those as well. Um, we have a question from a third grader, AJ, who wants to know, what do you do when the power goes out and how do you know what needs fixed? That's a really good question. And actually the room I'm standing in right here is kind of our operations center. This is where our operations manager, who's an electrical engineer, and everybody who we congregate in this room to try to figure out exactly what's happening on our system. So we also use radio. We have a pretty sophisticated radio system that allows us to communicate out to all of the line workers and they communicate back to us here in the operations center. So they're kind of our eyes out in the field. So they relay all the things that they're seeing our operations team and our operations manager make the decisions on what we need to do next, what needs fixed, what may not need fixed and what we need to do to immediately get power restored to as many people as we can. Okay, and one more question before we kind of move on. Um, from a fourth grade classroom, I wanted to ask um, again, how the wires all connect from a power plant through a substation into our homes and buildings? It's, it, it's a pretty complicated system. And if you were to look at a map of the whole United States, it looked like somebody took spaghetti and threw it all over an entire <laughs> map because there's, there's lines going every which way. But at the end of the day, as you kind of zoom in a little bit further to each level, so from the transmission level, that's kind of our, our furthest zoom out. You start to go in a little bit further, there's a there's a, a wire somewhere that connects from one of those towers, those big towers, that connects to another transformer at a substation, that connects to another line that ultimately go all across the city and then eventually comes into your house or your home or your building or your school, wherever you you may be. So it's it's a very uh, sophisticated and uh, fascinating system. You know, Chris, we always want to give advice to our students, our younger students, even some of our high school students are kind of thinking what the next step might be. So what would you tell students interested in careers in electricity distribution? I would tell you that right now, the electric utility uh, industry is, is rapidly changing. Just like a lot of industries out there, uh, there's a lot of disruption occurring. A lot of people who are very, very smart thinking about different and better ways we might be able to do this. Everyone is, is really interested in sustainability and how can we help our planet sustain the, our lives for, for the future and the generations to that follow us. There's just so many different and exciting things happening. And you don't, you don't have to be interested in engineering to get in, involved. Uh, like, I, like I mentioned before, we've got line workers. So um, you could, we, we actually have an in, kind of like an internship program for line workers where they come in as high school students and they work with us for uh, a summer and even a year. Uh, to learn all the ins and outs of line work. Um, arborists who uh, are interested in their outdoors, they're climbing trees and, and trimming trees and do, they understand trees in and out and how to make them live and healthy and kind of coexist with our, with our electric lines. Um, we just have a lot of really, really exciting opportunities here. And the future is even, even more exciting if you think about all the, the cool technologies that are yet to come. Think about electric cars and how that's going to change and impact our, uh, our jobs in the future. So I'd encourage you just to kind of look at the system a little bit, dig in a little bit deeper, uh, ask questions. Uh, I know here at Westerville, we're always open and interested for young people to come in and, and learn more about what we do so we can uh, get them as excited as we are about the electric industry. 
Awesome. I know we have a lot of questions coming in and we're going to try to get to all of them. And even if we don't get them uh, to your questions right this moment, we'll try to answer as many as possible towards the end. Uh, we will go we're going to go ahead and transition um, to our next location on our field trip. Um, and right now we're going to introduce a careers interview from Elias, who's an apprentice line worker, and Co Cody, who's a journeyman line worker. My name is Elias Markley. Um, I'm an apprentice lineman here at Westerville Electric Division, and I've been here full time for about three years. Um, I went to a high school vocational school for uh, people that want to work like hands on jobs, and I got, they had power line there. So that's where I got started there. We learned how to climb poles and stuff and learned about the basics of electricity there for a couple years. That's actually, I got this job. But I go. I am now. I have this job. I go to school up in Mount Gilead, Ohio, where we basically learn. I go about two to three times a year, for out, weeks out of a year, and basically learn stuff that we're doing here on the job. We learn in school. Most of our training is here up on the on the job training, but uh, we do a bunch of different stuff. We I probably go there ten times throughout my schooling. So basically a bunch of different stuff. Learn how to how transformers work on a pole and learn how to climb a pole better and do hurt man rescue and a bunch of different stuff there. The basics of electricity and all that kind of fun stuff. I got into line work because I did not want to have an office job. I didn't want to work inside. I wanted to work outside. And I like the idea of climbing 40 foot poles and being in bucket trucks up 40 to 50 foot in the air. Um, yeah, I just wanted to be outside. That was the main reason. So basically, I get here in the morning. I come down to this truck, this is my truck. I make sure everything, I fill up the water jug, make sure it's fully stocked, because we, we got a bunch of stuff in it, so make sure we're not missing anything. Make sure all of our hand battery tools, all the batteries are charged up. And then we head out to the day we don't really have, we don't do the same thing every day. One day we might be setting a pole. The next day we might be pulling underground wire to a house, a house that's getting built, a new service for that. So it's pretty much every day is different, which I love. I wouldn't want to do the same thing every day. So I think it's great that I get a different variety of things to do. So obviously you got to have electricity on all the time. So sometimes storms come through and knock down power lines or a car hits a pole. So basically we could get the call in the middle of the night. We might be at home and say, hey, a car hit a pole or a storm came through, knocked a bunch of wire down. So we can work all night long in the dark and through the rain. It doesn't matter. We got to get the power back on because everyone needs electricity. It doesn't matter what time it is or what the weather is. We got to get it back on. About six months ago, we had a, it was raining all night long and everything was wet and a trash truck took, had its boom up and took out about three poles. So we had to change all those out in the early morning and it was raining the whole time and that, so that wasn't very fun, but we got her done. Having, when the storm comes through and uh, everyone's power's off and getting their power back on and seeing the smile on their face and stuff, just they're like thank you so much they're so most of the time they're so grateful for what you do and that's pretty rewarding today um, we have a switch that was out in the field and we needed to change the oil in it because it had some water in it and it just it was all dirty so uh, we got all the water or oil drained out of it and we're putting a new seal on it because the old seal was all nasty and that's how the water got in it so we're working on that right now like I said, we do all kinds of different stuff. It's not the same thing every day. You never know what you're going to do. Um, this is Bryce, one of our high school internship, uh, interns. Um, he is currently going to a vocational school like I was for power lines. So he gets the opportunity to come here over the summer and every other week here through the winter to get to learn his skill about being a power lineman and see if he likes to do it in real life or not. And so this is Bryce. My name is Cody Leitner. I'm a journeyman lineman. I've been working for the city for 10 years and uh, training for our job is about five years of schooling 
often for us, it's you go to school for a week, then you do on the job training till your next uh, school. So that could be a month, it could be two months from then. But you go for a week at a time, then you do on the job training for the rest of the time, then you do that for five years. And once you finish that, then you have like about a year to finish your hours. Then you come and join the engineering. What made me go into the career of Lyman would be uh, my dad was actually Lyman, and my grandpa worked for Ohio Bell. This is kind of similar, but uh, yeah, my my dad was the main one that got me wanting to get into line work, getting to go help people. That when the lights go out, if there's a big storm, it's just awesome to help people out. A typical day for us. Well, right now I am on the underground crew, so a typical day for us is working on uh, underground utilities. Like right now, we're working in a new housing or a new condo development, and we're uh, pulling in wire. We're splicing wire. We're actually right now we're working on pulling wire into the garages. So, and this is pretty much just the final step for us. But uh, we have two other crews that are overhead crews. So they usually work on the overhead lines. So they get to go work up in the air. And then there's another crew that is just like does miscellaneous stuff. So works on street lights, works on outages, whatever comes up in the day. So a non typical day for us would be like first of all a big storm comes through like there's been a couple over the summer where it was lunchtime and a storm came through and it just knocked out a bunch of power to like everybody then uh, we're just like running around trying to figure out what's going on we have to figure out what what we have to assess all the damage first but then other than that uh, I've been to other states I've been working in New York to work at night storm we've been going down to Florida to work hurricanes um, we've even done some mutual aid here close in Ohio so it's like endless things the most rewarding part is uh if there is an outage or something like that and then people are out of power for a couple couple days a couple hours especially if it's cold out it's hot out and you get their power turned back on and their people are really grateful it's just, it's just awesome to help people out this is actually uh we we're doing an underground job and we we're opening up uh, a transposer it kind of looks like like this back here but it's it's smaller and uh, we opened up and there was a skunk in it <laughs> and that was the most unusual thing that's probably happened to me like we opened it up and there's just a skunk there just staring there uh, looking at us and we had to remove that piece of equipment so we were uh, we really didn't know what to do to get the skunk out so that was pretty unusual for us the job is very rewarding it's, you get the it's like one of the best blue collar jobs you can have you're, out, you're outside working um, if you're on a if you're on like a, a another company like a contract or something you could be going and working storms for like like a hurricane or something. You could go work for two, three weeks at a time. Come back, then another hurricane comes in. And you can go right out, right back out of town. It's, it's a very, very uh, rewarding job, but it's also uh, very hands-on. I mean, you're going to use your hands a lot. And the the best thing too is like we get to climb a lot. We get to climb all the wooden poles a lot, and even some of us get to compete in uh, line worker rodeo. So that's pretty fun too. It's, it's, Awesome that looks like some awesome work that Cody and Elias do on a regular basis. Um, we are now in the outdoor yard area and bucket truck area of our field trip. Um, we do have some questions we would like to pose to our host now, uh, John. Um, is John there? I am. Hi, John. So we have a couple of questions. We had a question from YouTube. Um, from YouTube, Karen Kelly wanted to know um, how much do the electricians make or the pay range um, or salary range for electricians? Well, the salary range for a, a power line worker in the utility system can range pretty widely depending on what where you are in this state alone and, and throughout the country. But the average uh, line worker can make anywhere from seventy to hundred thousand dollars a year. Awesome. Students, are you listening? <laughs> you can make a very good living working in this field. Um, also, we have a question from Kenzie um, from YouTube. We wanted to know how much power can each power line hold? Uh, it depends on the thickness of the wire. Basically, we build the lines to hold what we know they're going to carry. So if we know we have a line that's going to hold a lot of load, we're going to use a lot thicker wire on that. And then we would on a distribution line that was just maybe feeding a couple houses, we use a much smaller wire. So we build the lines to carry the load that we know that's going to have. A larger industrial customer is going to have a lot larger wire 
going to their system than a residential house. Awesome. We have a great question from Jessica who wanted to know, how do these squirrels not get electrocuted when they chew on the lines? Where would you say is the most frequent area to have outages? Uh, well, the squirrels do get electrocuted quite <laughs> often, but that's usually when they're transferring from one thing to another. So we've all seen a bird sitting on a wire not getting shocked, right? So that bird is just sitting there. He's not touching anything but that wire. Where the squirrel gets into trouble is he can't fly. So when he goes to transfer from the tree to the wire or from the pole to the wire, that's when he makes contact and he touches two things at once. And that electricity is always trying to go back to earth and it'll use whatever conductor it can get. And that conductor can be you, it can be a squirrel, it could be the wires. So the most outages we have are in the heavily treed areas, especially in the rural areas where there's a lot of critters. From a seventh grade classroom, a great question. How many people does it take to fix one power line? Uh, that can vary a lot depending on what happens. Uh, we had a recent storm here in Westerville that took out, uh, I think it was half a dozen poles in one stretch. So we had three or four crews of two to four man crews working that whole situation at one time. Or if it's just a single home that's out of power or possibly two or three houses, I may use one of these sticks here and go out and grab that uh, fuse out of the air and replace it by myself. So it, it just depends on what the outage is. Then one more question before we move on to your piece. How old do you have to be to work with electricity? The minimum age is 18 to climb poles, to work with live lines. And that it also, it's not just your age, you have to have the training. The one thing that we, this business, electricity, we, we know it's dangerous and, it, and it's hazardous, but we do everything to mitigate that hazard that we can do. We use a lot of what we call personal protective equipment or PPE, which some of it you can see here behind me. We use a lot of insulators, which is anything that doesn't want to conduct electricity well. So we use a lot of fiberglass and rubber goods and plastics and porcelain and all those things help protect us and keep that wire from transferring the energy through us. Awesome. Thanks, John. So I'll go ahead and uh, let you take over and discuss the tour of the truck and electrical safety. All right, so if we come over this way, many of you probably have seen something like this green box in your yard, probably wondered what it was, or maybe you knew what it was. This is what brings the power to your house. This is called an underground distribution transformer. So what's inside of it? Let's take a look. When you see one of these in your yard, this is what you'll find. These would be the primary wires coming in, feeding the transformer at 7,620 volts each. And then these would be the wires that would go out and feed the houses in the neighborhood. The larger wires in the back, we might feed three or four houses at a time off of, and each one of these would go to an individual house. So when you see these out in your yard, do not play on or around them. They, anytime these things can go bad. Electricity is always wanting to go back to ground. And when these parts start to wear out, that electricity can get out of there and it can energize this entire box. So we want to stay away from them, stay off of them. And another thing, when you, when you have one of these in your yard, we encourage you not to plant trees, shrubs, bushes around them. Because when we have to get in here to work, we need room. So if I have to get in this transformer and work, I may grab a large stick like this. We call this a shotgun stick, mostly because of the noise it makes. I need this much room to get in here and work. So if you can see, this is an eight foot stick. I need to have that room in here to work. So we encourage you not to put anything sheds, plants, shrubs in front or around these so that we can work safely when we have an outage. A lot of the other tools we use, if you see behind me here, I talked about insulators and isolators. Fiberglass is a very good non-conductor. Fiberglass we use a lot. Almost all of our sticks are made of fiberglass. This would be what we call a hot arm extension. You might see this up at the top of the pole with the wire laid out in the cradle to hold the wire so we can move the wires away from the pole so we can work in close to the pole with those hot lines worked away from us. Because nowadays, we work everything hot. Rarely do we take an outage to fix a power line. We usually have to work it hot because as Chris discussed earlier, the, the need for, for everybody to stay on all the time is greater every day. 
John, so I'll I talk mean to interrupt you, Go but ahead. we do have a question from Jessica John who asks, Absolutely. do you remember the worst power out outage you've had and do you use nuclear energy for power? Well, the worst outage I've been on since I've been in the business now for 18 years. And the worst one was the, the ratio we had that came through Ohio and we got a lot of heavy straight line winds. I worked, I believe it was 42 hours straight to get just as myself. I know we had other guys that worked as many as that or more, but it was one of the worst ones. We had stuff down everywhere. I think at one point we had 15,000 of our 17,000 customers out of power. And uh, we are not nuclear fed as far as I know. Most of the power generation in Ohio is either coal, gas, uh, trash, or hydro. So I talked a little bit in the beginning about protecting us and how that squirrel gets shot. Well, we can only touch one thing at a time. So we use, like I said, a lot of insulators. Rubber's a very good insulator, fiberglass. So if I was gonna work the power lines, you might see me put on a set of rubber sleeves set of rubber gloves and that gives me one layer of protection but I also might work out of this bucket truck and get in the bucket to isolate me from the ground now I have two layers of protection so we always try and keep at least two layers of protection between us and the live lines that enables us to work everything hot <clears throat> we talked a little bit about uh, the squirrels if you've ever been in your neighborhood and you heard a loud boom and then the power goes out. A lot of people think, oh, well, a transformer exploded or something, but it's really usually one of these. This is a fuse holder. We have a long fuse that goes through this tube and it's got a charge powder charge in it. So when that squirrel chews on that line and gets caught, that fuse will actually explode. That's the loud bang you hear. And then this fuse holder will drop out and disconnect the power so that we can find the problem and put it back in safely. So for that, Say I'm in your backyard and I can't get my bucket truck back there. I might grab a stick like this, which we call our extendo stick. This stick will go up 45 feet in the air. So I don't have to climb that pole or get my truck to it. I may just use this stick, reach up there, grab that fuse door and bring it down to the ground and refuse it and then send it back up and close it with this stick bringing your power back in as short a time as possible. We measure our outages usually in minutes nowadays, not in hours like in the past. John, we have a question from Peyton who wants to know what would happen if a power line snaps? That can be a very dangerous situation. When a power line snaps and comes to the ground, that does not necessarily mean that line went dead. That line could still be live. And the bad part about it is sometimes that line it might be laying on the ground. It might be dancing around and sparking and jumping and making noise, or it might just be laying there looking like it's not doing anything, but that does not mean it's dead. You always need to stay away from any downed wires you see. You can never tell if it's live or dead just by the way it looks. Um, also, Sam Johnson wants to know, once the electric becomes the blue monster and leaves the line, <laughs> how far can it travel? <laughs> uh, usually it can only travel as far as the air can ionize around it. So in a normal situation where that arc occurs, basically what, it, what you're seeing is ionization of the air and the, and the heat. And that does get hotter than the sun, about 35,000 degrees is what that arc is. And it's also in that arc is creating shrapnel. You're getting pieces of that aluminum starting to melt, the steel, the copper, that's all melting and shooting out at the same time. So it is very hot. And if it does touch anything, it will catch it on fire. So one of the other pieces of PPE we always wear, just in case those sort of, sort of things happen, is fire retardant clothing. Everything I'm wearing right now is fire retardant. That doesn't mean it won't catch on fire, but it means if it does catch on fire, it'll extinguish as soon as the heat is removed and it'll burn cleanly. It won't get into my skin. I also might wear a face shield. If I suspect that there, there's a problem that might bring me some trouble, I might wear a face shield like this, and you notice it's tinted green, and that's to help protect my eyes from the flash, just like you would protect yourself from welding. And then it also comes clear down to the bottom of my neck to help protect my face from that heat and from that shrapnel. Good question. We also have a, this is a great question um, pertaining to our, the pandemic that we're in. How has COVID impacted your job? 
Well, I would say not as much as you would think. We've literally worked nonstop through this entire COVID season starting last year. We have to be here to keep your power on. So we've made every adjustment we can make. We have guys have to wear masks when they're working near each other and together. Even if they're in that bucket truck together, they have to be wearing a mask to, to help protect themselves. We do everything we can to stay away from our customers, to stay away from each other. We have have protocols. If somebody starts to feel sick, what, what are we going to do then? But in reality, we've worked every day through this whole thing because we're here to keep your power on and somebody has to be here 24 hours a day. Awesome. Cassie Sharp wants to know, how do you make the pole or power line? Ah, okay. Well, that would be this truck here. So when we start to build a power line, I've seen a little bit of that in the original video. We'd grab a pole from our pole yard, set it on this truck, use that giant auger, that screw looking part up there, dig that hole in the ground. And there's a set of claws up there and a, and a rope. We pick up the pole, set that pole in the ground. Then we'd back this truck over to it and we'd take and build the cross arm, that T you see at the top of the pole. We'd, and any other equipment we needed on that pole would be built from this truck. We have an awesome question from a seventh grade class. When a power line explodes, is it a blue spark instead of a typical orange yellow sparks? Yes, for some reason when, uh, when electricity explodes, it is almost always bluer in color than it is any other thing. You will get those other colors because there may be a coating on that wire. There may be equipment that is rubber or, or some other kind of material around that wire that starts to catch fire. But the arc itself, if you've ever seen somebody welding, is usually blue because it's that hot. Um, Keep them coming. <laughs> um, we have a question from Amy. Uh, what happens when an electrical pole falls down? Okay, so they're in another situation. It depends. It depends on the equipment that's on that pole. Likely the wires came down and that could be live and, and like I said, very, very dangerous. We always want to stay away from any down wires. We could have a, like, let's say a car pole accident. One of the most dangerous things to do if you're in a car pole accident is to get out of the car. You do not want to get out of the car. You want to try and get your car out of the situation as far as possible if, if the car's mobile. If not, you need to stay in that car till you get help because just like that bird on a wire, if those wires are touching your car, your entire car becomes energized at the voltage of that wire. That means if you try and step out and touch one foot on the ground and you're still touching the car, that's gonna, electricity is gonna wanna take the path through you. So if you ever get in a situation like a car pole accident, stay in the car. Very so good. We have two great questions from a third, uh, third grade class from Cassie. Um, Sherman's third grade class, they first want to know, does electricity work with Wi-Fi distribution? Electricity powers the routers that push the Wi-Fi signal. And then they also want to know, why do you have to buy electricity? <laughs> well, I guess that would be to pay all those high salaries that everyone makes. No, <laughs> it's, because, it's because it takes a lot of money to generate the power because as Chris demonstrated earlier in, with the uh, graphic, we've got money in generating the power at the generation station. We've got money in building the infrastructure to carry it from there to the substation. We've got money and equipment in the substation to turn it into a distribution voltage to bring it to your house. We've got money and people to build the lines to bring it to your house. So everything in the world costs money and we're just a part of that system. We have uh, also another great question from Melissa Tackett's third grade class who wants to know if it's storming and lightning outside, do you still fix outages on, on the lines or do you wait until it's safer for you? This is a great question about safety. That is a good question. And like I said about safety earlier, we do everything in our power to make it as safe as possible. But we will go out and work that storm. Now, if there's lightning in our immediate area, we'll call a cease and have everybody stand down. Or if there are extra high winds above 40 mile an hour, we'll have them stand down. But we work in the rain, sleet, snow, the blister and heat. It doesn't matter. We're out here to keep your power on. Um, Ms. Uh, Everett's uh, student, Rich, wants to know what would happen if a power line would hit another power line? Uh, that's what we'd call uh, a short. You're touching two things together that aren't supposed to. So 
each line's energized, but each line's at a slightly different voltage and or, uh, sorry, a slightly different voltage. So if they touch each other, then those two lines are not jive. They're not meeting up. So that's going to cause that arc. Just like in, if you were to take a, a tree and get it into the wire, the wire into the ground, you're going to see that arc because they can't, you can never touch two things with electricity. We have a YouTube question. What do you do if you can't use the extender stick or the truck? Climb the pole. We got, we have a lot of guys climb poles. If you were to climb the pole, I might use a shorter stick like this one here. So this is a 10 foot stick. So I might climb up to where I'm just 10 foot from that cutout and use this type of stick to open and bring that down and change the fuse. We use any, we have sticks in every length you can imagine. We do everything we can. We always have to have that two layers of separation. So if we have to climb that pole, now I have to have my rubber gloves and sleeves on and I have to have this stick. That's my two layers of protection to keep me from getting hurt while changing that fuse. Good question. Um, someone wants to know how, how ha, have you or anyone you know ever gotten shocked on the job? Well, unfortunately, yes. <laughs> that is a, it is a hazard of the business. I have been shocked uh, at 7,200 volts. It was not pleasant, but it was survivable. Uh, it was a hot day and I was uh, in my rubber gloves and sleeves and I reached across to get a piece of rubber off the line and the sweat poured out of my sleeves and that got me shocked. So I was not making a good contact, plus I was in a bucket truck. So that saved me, but it is a very unpleasant feeling. And I have worked with people that have survived uh, direct contacts but it is not something we, we strive to do. We strive to do everything we can to not have that happen. Um, Zachary Richardson from YouTube wants to know how much electricity is used in a day to power Westerville? Whew, that'd be more of a Chris question, but uh, it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're, in the, we're in the megawatts. So it's, it's uh, millions of watts of electricity used every day. Okay, Jessica John wants to know, how many trucks does Westerville own? Uh, just in line trucks, we have two of the large bucket trucks like this one. We have one slightly smaller than this one that goes about the same height, but it has a different type of boom. Then we have two what we call alley trucks or trouble trucks that are only go about 35 to 40 foot high. Then we have two of the digger derricks for setting poles and transformers. And we even have a backyard machine that's on tracks that can take a person up in the air to work on a pole in a backyard or set a transformer or set a pole in a backyard. It's basically this truck, but it'll go through a 36 inch gate. Good question. John, John, do the trucks run on diesel fuel? Yes, all of our trucks, except for one are our diesel trucks. We do have one gas uh, motor truck and we use a lot of other equipment here. I, I know Chris talked briefly about the diversity of this job and the guys talked about how it's different every day. If you pan over just over this way, you might see some other equipment we have. We use, we use backhoes, we use trackos, we have excavators, we have everything that you can imagine to put this infrastructure in. So you're, when they say you're not doing the same thing every day, they really mean it. We, have a, we might be doing underground one day or overhead the next, and we always have to have a piece of equipment to get that job done. Good question. Um, and then it's this coming from the same um, person, Jessica, the last two questions, wanted to know how many gallons does it take to fill one truck and how much does that usually cost? Okay, well, our trucks uh, have a 30 gallon tank on them. So that takes roughly 30 gallons of diesel fuel. Uh, the average price of diesel fuel is probably around three to three to $4 a gallon. So roughly $120. A great question from Mark. Um, is, but that diesel, that excuse me, that diesel I'm fuel sorry. will last us a lot longer than gasoline. So these trucks on a full tank of fuel, they'll run 24 hours on one tank of fuel, straight, nonstop. Wow. Um, we have a question from Mark. I wanted to know if the lightning um, hit a pole, what would happen? Ah, that's a very good question. Well, we have what we call lightning arresters. We do get lightning strike the poles quite often. It actually usually strikes the lines on top of the pole. So if you look in this transformer here, all these transformers are eventually fed from an overhead line. So this apparatus right here with the ground wire on it, this is a lightning arrestor for an underground distribution. The ones we have for the pole tops are gray and they have little fins on them. 
They look about like the insulators that hold the wires, but they're, they're just different. And they won't let voltage pass through until it hits that level of overcurrent that is produced by the lightning. And then it'll actually flash through there, take that lightning strike, bring it to the ground safely, and then carry the, the line should be less affected by that and, per, and our equipment protected. Hey, there's a, there's a truck loaded up with a pole getting ready to go out and be set. Wendy uh, Patton wants to know, how long does it take to repair a power line? Uh, that depends a lot on the situation. If it's just a single line going down, our guys, our average outage times are usually 20 to 30 minutes. I mean, if, it's, if we're going out there to change out a fuse or change out a transformer, we might ex extend it with a transformer maybe into an hour. And if we have a car hit a pole and take down several lines, it could be three or four hours. But we do a great job in the city of Westville, just pat myself on the back a little bit, of being a reliable system. We are 99% reliable. We do way better than some of our competitors in the, in the open market. But we're a small system. We've got people that we brought up on this system from their apprenticeship all the way up through their journeyman. Then they know the system inside and out. So we are able to keep our outages to a real minimum, no matter what the situation. Sam wants to know, how tall can you make a power line? Ah, good question. Well, if you can see, can you see that pole over there, Sue? That large pole over there, that's about a 85-foot pole. Average for the, that's a transmission pole that we talked about with a really high voltage. That's a 69,000 volt line. So we put that as high as possible. So that way we can build underneath of it with our lower voltage lines. So the average here, I'd say probably our tallest pole would be 85, 95 foot here in town. And then is down as low as 40 foot. Wow. Um, Kim Rees wants to know what happens if a power line snaps? Uh, it's going to come to the ground at some point or land on something. And whatever it lands on is going to become energized. And it's either A, going to catch on fire and burn, or B, it's going to sit there and smolder and spark until it goes out and it kicks that circuit out. It could trip the circuit and make the electric shut off, but it's never a guarantee. So again, when you see a downed line of any kind, do not get anywhere near it. 30 feet is too close. That line, when it's touching something, Whatever that, say it falls on a fence, that fence becomes energized at the same voltage as that line. So 7,620 volts, let's say. In concentric rings, like a ripples in the water when you throw a pebble in, away from that fence, that electricity is spreading out through the ground. So we have to do either a hop or a shuffle type situation to get away from there. Because if you spread your feet apart, one ring may be energized at 100 or 1,000 volts, and then another ring may be energized at 1,400 volts. And that difference in voltage is going to try and go from through you from one foot to the other. And that spreads away from any situation like that's energized. Whether it falls on a car, a fence, a shed, you got to be aware of that. And a 30-foot range is about as, about as usually as far as it'll spread, but you never want to push that limit. Good question. Um, we have a, a great question from Kim. What energizes a power plant? Ah, that depends on the power plant type. Uh, it could be a gas-fired power plant where they use natural gas to heat water to make steam to turn turbines. Or it could be a hydroelectric plant, like say we have, like the ones we have down on the Ohio River, where the current pushing past the plant, the water pushing past, is actually what turns the turbines, which in turn makes electricity through a generator. We have um, a question from a third grade class from Butler County who wanted to know why not use windmills to generate the electricity and how do solar panels work? We do use windmills to generate electricity. The problem with windmills is you need a very large area of open area so that wind has enough speed to turn the, the windmill efficiently. They're not efficient if we, like in an area here, we wouldn't do a lot of solar here uh, as you can see today, it's cloudy, it's miserable out, but solar and wind have to be just the right situation. So you need that long open area for the wind to really carry and turn those blades, or you need a lot of sunshine like out in Nevada. But solar panels work by the sun heating up the photovoltaic cells in the solar panel that they're made of, and that in turn generates electricity, and then that's 
uh, shuffled off into a battery storage system or right back directly onto the power lines. We have a YouTube question. Um, someone wanted to know how long would it take to fix a fallen pole? Uh, usually if it's just a, just a pole, just an inline pole with not much on it, it might take us an hour, hour and a half, but that depends if there's a lot of equipment on that pole, if there's a transformer on that pole or there's a switch on that pole or that pole has multiple lines going in multiple directions off of it, then that may extend into four or five or six hours. Uh, Cynthia Dorsey wants to know, what's the buzzing sounds when you walk under the power lines, especially on rainy days? That is a, uh, uh, ozone around the wires crackling. So when, and usually you would only hear that on the really high voltage lines. Like uh, here in Westville, we have Towers Park where the, uh, I think that's a 765,000 volt line that crosses over the Hoover Dam there. So when you get up into that higher voltage, the air around the power line is actually what you hear crackling. The moisture and the ozonation in the air around the power line is what you hear cracking. Awesome. I have one more question for you, John. Um, so what advice, I asked Chris this earlier um, during his piece, but I wanted to know what advice or something that you could tell students interested in the career in the distribution industry? Like what advice would you give training or skills do you think they need in order to pursue a, a career in this field? I think that's a great question. I know, uh, like I said, I've been in this business for 18 years now. I did my apprenticeship in Wadsworth, Ohio, and then transferred to here. Uh, and now I started, I was, did my apprenticeship as a, a line worker. And eventually I worked my way into the safety side of things. But there are, there are career centers throughout the country now that you can go to, pay a nominal fee and, and get trained to do this type of work to get you a job. Most of them will have job placement. Uh, your local vocational schools. This is one of the most rewarding careers that you can have and not come out with a bunch of college debt. So if you start an apprentice program through say Westerville or Wadsworth or any other city like that, you're getting paid while you go to school. You're in school being trained to be a line worker, but you're getting paid while you do it. And so when you're done, you don't have that student loan debt. So as an alternative to, to college and degrees in that direction, we need people in the skilled trades. We've lost 40% of our skilled workers in this trade in the last 20 years due to retirements. I mean, this business and a lot of others, we always need skilled workers. And this is a skilled trade. It takes four-year apprenticeship, working day in and day out on it, and going to school at the same time. And when you come out, that sense of accomplishment, and that sense of like, helping your neighbors get their lights back on, you just, it's so rewarding. You can't, I can't recommend anything else. Well, thank you so much, John. To all of our participants, thank you for watching. This was a wonderful field trip. Um, it wouldn't be possible with all of you. Thanks to Westerville Electric Division, to Chris and John for taking your time out today to speak with all of our students uh, on both Zoom and YouTube. I wanna thank all the people in the background for making all the magic happen and bringing the virtual field trip to all of you today. Um, one more thing before you log off, if you're on Zoom, there will be a post field trip evaluation for you to fill out in your browser at the end. If you're watching from YouTube, there will be a follow up with a link to complete the evaluation. So please fill that out. This will be recorded so you can share with all of your uh, classroom neighbors and friends. Um, this will be recorded and placed on YouTube. Um, please be on the lookout for more virtual field trips coming this spring. We have a field trip at the solar panel installation and utility tree trimming. Um, and more details are coming your way for those uh, future field trips. Again, thank you for joining us. Hope to see you back for future uh, field trips. Bye.